any comments at all? Yeah, talk about that at all? What do you think about it? Did she, did she provoke a lot of thought about how the linkage between landscape design and nitrogen cycling are too complex? No, no comment? So, so next week, because of this active discussion we're having, I'm going to ask you some questions from Susan's talk and ask you to, to participate back. Okay? The first week I thought it was great. We had, we had some really neat discussions going on about um, runoff and the landscapes and things. Uh, so next, so be prepared next Friday. Uh, first for a couple of minutes, uh, I'd like to have a discussion of what was covered by Susan's talk today. Okay. Okay, so introducing Susie Kocher. Coker. I was corrected by my <coughs> Susie Coker is from El Dorado County. She's uh, you're housed up in South Tahoe. Um, she studies the the Big Tahoe Basin, and as you'll see, she's going to talk about uh, how development uh, affects the, the fisheries uh, habitat. Okay. Thanks, Thank Lauren. And I'm really glad to be here, and I'm really glad uh, I looked at your overall. Um, agenda for all the different speakers and you're getting a really great I think overview and you know of what's really current and what's going on right now in the field and what people are currently worrying about and trying to solve those problems. So I commend Lauren, I'm happy to be here. Um, my name is Susie Coker. I work for the University of California Cooperative Extension. And so we're the outreach arm of the university. Um, uh, Lauren, as well, is an extension specialist, which means he's uh, academic based on a campus. I'm an advisor, which means I'm an academic based in a county. So um, uh, UC, Division of Ag and Natural Resources, we have staff in 57 of the 58 counties in California, and we're supposed to be responding to local needs. So there's a little process that says, El Dorado County, what do you need? And uh, we have a farm advisor that st uh, specializes in homology and wine grapes and works with the local industry there. Um, we have people who do horticulture, we have people who do water, uh, wildfire issues. Uh, I'm a forester, and so I'm up in um, the south uh, Lake Tahoe, I'm in a Tahoe Basin, so I'm working mostly on forestry and fire issues up there. But before I got there, I worked for about um, 10 years for the Center for Forestry at Berkeley and got involved in um, fish habitat issues, responding with local um, governments, trying to understand how to protect fish habitat, and see how well they were doing in their policies and procedures and development process. And so what I'm going to talk to you about, and you saw the publication um, we wrote after having worked with counties and cities and local jurisdictions over about a five to eight year period. So I'm not a fisheries biologist, I'm a forester. Uh, the uh, name on that paper that we handed you was Lisa Thompson. She's a fisheries biologist. She's here and specialist for extension. She's here on the Berkeley, on the Davis campus. And she's really great. She does lots of great fish projects and monitoring all over the state. So I will do my best to tell you about the fish issues. But if you really want to know about fish, she's the one to see. Um, and we worked a lot more with the riparian habitat and things like that. My goal today is to tell you a little bit about uh, California salmonids, the issues uh, for their habitat and how development affects that habitat, and then what's being done, what our local policy solutions are, where we're at for trying to improve things. Well, so you all know California grows uh, quickly, leaps and bounds, uh, over 8 million in the next 15 years, we think. Another 373,000 acres of undeveloped land should be converted to, um, to residential uh, uses. And these figures actually are that out of that publication. Um, and so we think the urban footprint will be expanding. Uh, some of that might be in already urban areas. Uh, and if you all grow up and be landscape architects, you know, maybe you'll be working in a city where they've already done all of this, but there's the potential that you'll be out in areas where you know, there hasn't been a lot of development doing these subdivisions of landscapes and that sort of thing. So there's a lot to know and keep in mind if you are freshly developing land so that you can avoid impacts. Because retrofitting after you've done it, boy, that's hard and expensive. Okay, so California salmon and trout, you, uh, together they're known as salmonids. We have 30, 31 distinctive kinds, 
20 of which are found only in our state. So we have a lot of diversity in our Salmata species. And part of the reason for this is because of our amazingly diverse climate in California. Um, you know, different mountain ranges, coastal ranges, uh, lots of areas where habitats are not connected. Southern California, a lot of the watersheds along the coast don't lead inland at all, and they can have subspecies of fish. So we have just a lot of biodiversity in the fish, the fish assemblages. Um, we have southern steelhead all the way down to Los Angeles County um, that are adapted to living in streams that grow dry every year. Hey, um, and so those fish uh, are very different than northern fish that need year-round water. So our adaptation strategies in our fish are incredibly broad um, in California as well. And as far as salmonids go, you know there, there aren't that many that actually go for living in habitats as intense as um, you know, LA County with dry streams that dry, dry up every year. What they do is they head to the headwaters and live in pools, and they wait for the water to come, and then they go downstream. So it's pretty amazing what those fish can do. Um, anadromous salmonids. Anadromous means that they migrate between inland and the ocean. We have salmonids that are not anadromous, that are landlocked. Your average rainbow trout that you might catch in a stream is the same fish that would then migrate to the ocean and be called a steelhead. So we have completely anadromous species. We have species that can do either. Um, and steelheads are, are amazing now. Um, so that's just your little life cycle. Everybody's seen your National Geographic. We're all impressed by the uh, amazing fortitude of a fish that can jump all the way back upstream, spawn and die. I mean, it's an inspirational life strategy. Uh, but to just summarize, they're eggs that are deposited in a stream in gravel, and they hatch. Um, they emerge, they're called fry. Uh, they rear in freshwater streams, some for just a few days before going to the ocean, some for as much as four years, depending on the species and the environmental conditions. Then as they migrate to the ocean, they're called smolts, and that happens at different times of the year. And they have to change their whole body chemistry to be able to handle salt water. Uh, they live in the ocean for between one and four years. And so as a strategy, this is pretty amazing because what you can eat in a stream is pretty limited to, you know, uh, macro, mac, uh, benthic macroinvertebrates or the bugs underneath the rocks and insects that fall in. But generally, you can't get that big in the stream because there's not that much food. But if you have a strategy to go out to the ocean, you can eat a lot. And you actually have very large fish that can result in you know, uh, 50, 100 pounds. So you, you grow in a protected area, you go out there, you feed, um, and then you come back. And you swim upstream and you spawn. Some species, well, you know, we know that we have that pattern in our mind of the, the fish that spawn and die. Um, but some of them, like the steelhead, they don't die every time. They can potentially come back four times and go, go back and forth. So they have a, a wide range of being able to do that. So that is the general salmonid um, habit. And uh, you know, if you're, a, if you're landlocked, then you would stop right here and you just do this without going down to the out, out, out into the ocean. OK, so what does a salmonid need? Uh, if any of you are fisher people, you would know that there are cold water fish and warm water fish. So a warm water fish would be like a bass that most self-respecting fisher people would not really want to eat. Um, and if you're a more discerning fisher person, you'd rather eat a cold water fish. Um, they start in spawning in um, gravel habitats here. Uh, this is called a red. It's a nest. They need nice uh, oxygenated water, so they can't be too cemented with sediment coming in from the watershed, or that will cut off their oxygen supply. So they need fresh, clean gravels uh, to spawn. To rear, they need fairly cool oxygenated water. They need hiding places. They need food. They need inputs from the watershed. Um, some of those southern steelhead actually do OK in pretty warm water and grow fast, as long as they get enough food. It's really about having enough metabolism to survive. Um, and then they need to migrate. They need that barrier-free route to and from the ocean. So like I said, um, rainbow don't have to 
become steelhead, they'll stay longer. And if you've ever known uh, coping salmon, is a landlocked um, um, sockeye salmon. So there are some versions that don't do the whole thing. Okay, so in California, I just want to go through some of the most important species. This is actually a picture of uh, the Kokomo Salmon Festival up in Itaho. Um the, the major species, we have Chinook, Coho, Steelhead Rainbow, and Cutthroat. Um, so eight species of Chinook salmon, or eight kinds with different habits. Uh, Coho, Steelhead, and then uh, three different kinds of cut, Cutthroat trout. So here's the Chinook. The Chinook are the big river fish like, coming up the Sacramento. Uh, and they once supported major commercial and recreational fisheries. They're all pretty much in decline. And then this is just a list, oops, sorry. This is the list of specific subtypes. So Southern Oregon, Northern California Chinook coming in. Some have fall runs on the Klamath. Some have spring runs. And they're confined in different areas. They're adapted to the different water flows of when they actually run. The central coast having issues uh, from watershed impacts, logging, grazing, other human factors. The central valley coming up through the Sacramento and the delta, obviously we have some delta issues. Uh, most are hatchery origin, but it's persisting. There's some winter and some <coughs> spring. Um, so, you know, when we developed California and set up our dams and our water system, that was one of the first big, really big impacts on fish. So fish used to be you know, all the way up into the Sierras and a lot of those areas. Now they're pretty much um, relegated to downstream from dams. Coho, um, these are the kind found mostly along coastal streams on the north coast with cold permanent flows of water intact forests. Some of those watersheds, like I was saying, they're very small and short. They don't connect to a big river system and so they come up into <coughs> those stream systems. They were a mainstay of sport and commercial fisheries. I'm not sure where we're at over right now if anybody has gone over to try to go fishing, say, in Eureka, that sort of area. Sometimes they have seasons and sometimes they have to shut them down because there's just not enough to go around. And um, sorry. we have the Southern Oregon Northern Coast is listed as threatened and the Central California Coast Coho is listed as endangered. There are a lot of state efforts through the Department of Fish and Game to recover coho and try and do projects to improve their abilities to survive. Um, but that's where it's at with coho. So you can see 1970s. This is all the West Coast, California, Oregon, Washington. So California, we're the squares. We've never had quite as many as, as uh, Oregon and Washington, but it's uh, you know, not looking really good. Steelhead. Uh, so it looks like a big fat rainbow. Here's the different runs. We've got winter, summer, Central Valley. They have uh, threats of different uh, reasons. Sometimes uh, the hatchery programs have diluted their um, genetic capabilities. Uh, coastal watershed sediment issues, dams, water diversion. Um, Southern California, you know. Heavily urbanized landscapes, passage barriers, water being used. It's really hard to be a fish there. I have a colleague that works down in Los Angeles. And she was studying one of the, they, they found a run that was there for about three years, and they all turned yellow and died. <laughs> so she's been working with different scientists to try and figure it out. But you know, in a heavily urbanized landscape, it's really hard to know exactly what that is. Or, you know, pesticide, water, yeah. I'm sorry, I, the coho that was endangered, was it the red, red, darker one? Of yeah, that's two? what they look like when they, um, okay. The, well, the, the ocean and the spawning, that's the same fish. It's the same Those fish. are two different it's runs, but they have a different look when they're spawning because, you know, okay. after they enter the streams, they don't eat anymore, uh, oh. and they are going to die, and uh, so they just put all their energy into going upstream. They have those jaw changes because they're no longer eating and they're just fighting the other males for space in the reds. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. Rainbow trout, you might know this one. Obviously it's a steelhead that hasn't gone out to the um, 
hasn't gone out to the ocean, but we have a, a number of you know, subspecies here. I didn't know before I did this project that we have an official state fish. Here it is, it's your California golden trout, and it's a native to the southern Sierra. So, um, some of these isolated species, you know, they're even harder for conservation efforts because they don't have a very large area of habitat to start with. Um, and we have specific McLeod, Goose Lake, the Eagle Lake rainbow trout too. Um, you know, Eagle Lake and some of our closed basins, the water evaporates rather than flowing anywhere. So it ends up having a pretty high pH. So Eagle Lake is somewhere about 9.2. And that's a, a trout that's specifically adapted to living at that high pH. So um, you know, we have a great assemblage of different strategies. And I should have put this on your list, but um, when I went to see where everyone was at, I went to this uh, SOS report by Cal Trout. We have, um, I think it came out about last year um, with Dr. Peter Moyle, who's a preeminent fish biologist in California who's on this campus. And he worked with Cal Trout. And he has a, a ranking of where they're at, um, ranking them from one to four, maybe one to five. One to five, you know, not a very good chance they'll survive with climate change and water reduction issues. Whereas, you know, some of them have a better chance. So that's a pretty good and current um, report that I would uh, steer you to if you want to know more about that. Okay, where are the fish? So all those that I listed right now, this is as of 2006. These are all locations where they're either federally or state threatened or endangered uh, listed, meaning they're on a, a threatened or endangered wildlife list. So if you're ever working in a project in those areas and you're mucking about in the stream, there will be regulatory frameworks that will tell you what you need to do. If you are putting in a bridge or a culvert or something like that, uh, or a subdivision in any area with a threatened or, or endangered fish, You'll have a U.S. Fish and Wildlife um, Section 7 consultation process. So um, people will let you know that you need to worry about these fish. Um, that doesn't mean there aren't fish here and here and everywhere else. And uh, even if they don't go out to the ocean, they still migrate up and down the watershed. You know, so there's still issues here that apply everywhere. So okay, so this is my so what slide. Okay, who cares about those fish? Well. I think you should care about the fish because they're an important ecosystem function. They're really an important part of the food web. Um, what they found in some of those, you know, kind of coastal watersheds, you have this huge, you know, 50-pound fish. He's bringing nutrients out from the ocean up into a watershed and adding nutrients to that watershed that wasn't there before. So it's a it's a way for nutrients to come into sort of nutrient limited systems. Um, there's such a thing as a salmon berry ever seen one, Native Americans put together the, the thought that, wow, sam these bushes grow and the salmon come up, and so we, they're kind of tied, bringing those nutrients in. Uh, economic base, commercial, recreational, people like to fish. Uh, it's also an iconic and culturally symbolic species. We have salmon, sam Sammy salmon here up at Lake Tahoe Coconut Fest, um, but all along the coast, you know, there's a lot of movements to try and get people to care more about their fish than they'll do things. Um, Native American culture, obviously, was very dependent on, on salmon coming in. Um, here is a picture of the Mighty Salmon Festival held almost every year, and they collect the fish at uh, Oroville Dam and they distribute it to people and in their community. So there's still you know, a really strong need for the fish. And if that still doesn't convince you, perhaps you should think of the fish as an ecosystem indicator. If the fish are really doing badly, maybe we will too. So this is Dr. Moyle, he said, the fish don't lie. The story they tell is that California's environment is unraveling. And we have, this is a symptom of a larger water crisis that unless addressed will severely impact every Californian. So maybe as the fish go, we would too. So if we can't really care about them on their own, maybe we should think of them as a you know, canary in the coal mine. Okay, so why are they declining? You know, there's a long list of things, uh, not all of which have to do with habitat. There's larger issues going on, right? We have climate and ocean conditions, El Nino effects. Uh, you know, that's not anything that we can do anything about. Uh, harvest, you know, most of that has been curtailed. The things that I think that are relevant to you 
are things like uh, changes in water quantity, stream channel changes, sedimentation, migration barriers. So I'm fo trying to focus on those specifically and how those are um, part of the land development process. So if you are working in a subdivision and putting in culverts or road crossings, straightening channels, clearing vegetation, uh, working on flood control, just have regular urban uh, runoff or changing water quantity by stormwater runoff or water use, then you're affecting the habitat conditions in the stream. So we would like to avoid doing that. And so I started with the one I thought was probably what you're not going to get from other people. You have a lot of great folks who are going to talk to you about water quantity, storm runoff, water quality. Um, but specifically the fish are fish barriers. Um, these can be caused by a height uh, gap, <coughs> velocity, the quantity of water. Um, so this, this upper picture here, you can see this culvert has focused all this water in a straight shot. It's shooting out. And so a lot of the barriers that they're finding are actually velocity barriers. Like the fish will get too tired. Or a juvenile fish can't go. Um, so how you arrange the speed of water really affects this. Uh, height, you can see this is a box culvert. You know, and then it's, once you get up there, it's, it's pretty shallow. So imagine being a fish, trying to get down the shallow culverts. That would have a big issue. Uh, here's a grade control. Are eroding, and so somebody put in some concrete, and now that's a great fish barrier as well. So, we want to avoid doing that. Um, like I said, if you're mucking about the fish stream, you will be uh, spoken to by the Fish and Wildlife Service or Department of Fish and Game, and they'll be reviewed. So, there won't be new ones created, um, as far as we know, from the best of our science, but there are a lot of things out there, a lot of problems that need to be fixed for the future. Yeah. So that technically is in, inappropriate, the grade control. Um, the fish can't move like the babies. And they wouldn't jump something like that. Uh, there's a lot of science that looks at it, okay. at what okay. exactly it is. You know, you can't yeah. be standing there the whole time to you, see. Yeah. And so um, the Forest Service and other um, agencies have developed some measurements that they feel are pretty accurate in predicting okay. whether or not things juveniles and adults can go up it. And this one's one that, uh, in our assessment, that was an issue. It's Absolutely. interesting, because Montgomery Creek, I've never even heard anybody talk about rainbow trout. I, I kind of feel like I've never, like no one even one? knew they existed. Rainbow, I mean, excuse me, yeah. Montgomery Creek, it's like Redding right, headed out toward the kind of last time. Yeah. Uh, before birding falls. Okay. And they have little tiny concrete barriers, and I realize that it, it keeps me. Well, there, they, there has been a whole effort to try and adapt older things that are out there, or take them out and redo them. So you'll often see like little step pools okay. built to go up that they can help. Okay. You know, there's a lot of legacy out there. Okay. And whether or not they actually do it, it's not that easy yeah. to observe. So okay. they think they have a pretty good methodology and a ranking system to try and convert these animals. But that's a pretty hot spot for fish, for she up going up into the sea. Oh, oh. Up Butte Creek and right. everything on north of there. There's a lot of really nice fish runs still. Deer, Deer Creek and Mill Creek. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, so that's still good. Then. Yeah, those okay. are like the best two best streams in this year for sure. Because okay, they good. were never dammed. Right. They actually plant for fishing so that people you know get their fill and leave everybody else alone, kind of. Like. <laughs> uh, that's the theory. Part of it. Okay. So um, instead. You want to make sure you're maintaining fish passage in the stream. So here was an outlet, you know, for a road where you're crossing the stream before it was replaced. And here it is after with an arched culvert or an arched culvert bridge. So that now you have a natural stream bottom. Of course, it cannot migrate, uh, which a stream would naturally do, but you still have a better chance as a fish. And you know, this is dry. That's just when they replace things, they dewater them, or this might have been the time of year. So it's not the quantity of water here that we need to notice, it's the fact that you know, we have a natural bottom that can rework itself and a fish is much more likely to be able to go up that stream. So this is actually where there's been the most work in a lot of um, local
local jurisdictions, going out, identifying these things, applying for money to fix them. And it's actually, you know, really expensive. <laughs> it's very expensive, but they feel that they get the most bang for the buck because now you've opened up habitat all the way up the stream and the fish can get a little farther. So there's a lot of great success stories of eliminating these barriers and getting the fish back upstream for more habitat, more places to spawn. Stream channel changes, urban stream syndrome. I think you're getting more of this on one of your future speakers, but just uh, you know, overall, uh, you have your natural stream and then you add stormwater runoff and sediment. You, some areas over on the coast, they worry about aggradation. They get buried in sediment. Uh, up in the Sierras where I'm from, more, mostly we worry about degradation. We worry about it going down, widening, getting cut off from its floodplain, drying out the vegetation above, just generally getting screwed up and no longer a, a stream connected to its floodplain. Uh, you know, here's an extreme example. <coughs> the stream in Neighborville and Trinity County, you know, you're in town, so you harden it and you make it a, like a ditch. There's actually, you know, coho in here, and uh, they're letting this degrade. And so they hang out in the little holes underneath the uh, cement. Who would have thought? Um, but I'm sure it's a candidate for a future project to improve the stream. Uh, so you put all that stuff in the stream that's not natural. It starts moving around. It's threatening your homes. It's threatening your roads. And we respond by stream bank stabilization. So this is a, a bunch of natural native gate. Oh, I'm sorry. So they're. Um, wire basket gauges and the plants growing in it. You know, this is your serious urban stream with a completely cement channel uh, to protect these homes built in a floodplain here in Palo Alto not that long ago. So, you know, this is bad for fish. This is not a natural stream. We don't like this. We like streams that can have the ability to move around and have some gravel in them. We don't like that. Um, Here's a house. The water was threatening. Here's the riprap in response. Now you've hardened the stream bank. There's no riparian vegetation. Um, and so you've degraded the quality of food inputs, the ability of the stream to move around, because this house is too close to this channel. Um, and we find that everywhere in California. People building right up to the sides of channels or streams. And uh, this is the inevitable result. And there's a lot of practices out there, good, bad, ugly. Got a good look at some of those. Here's a, another little stream with perched logs. So like logs put there. Maybe that's a little better. It's soft. It's not permanent. Maybe plants can grow there. But there, there's an amazing variety of things that have been done to make that stream channel, channel stable <coughs> and not threaten private property. So here's another, you know, brand new one. Here's the stream. You know, and eventually, as that stream moves, you're going to have a lot of pressure to fill in, rip wrap take out the edge, harden. Um, so instead, we shouldn't channelize streams. There's a lot of permitting process through the Department of Fishing Game. Generally, you won't be allowed to anymore. Uh, levees, flood walls, all these things kind of get in the way of the stream's natural function. <coughs> Don't build in floodplains or next to streams because this private landowner's property interest will win out. And next thing you know, you have uh, river rack. If you can manage a setback farther away, then you have more chance in the future of keeping that stream channel natural. Other ways to maintain natural channels, there's a evolving practices to um, use fish, more fish friendly techniques. So this one's already pretty incised and hardened, but instead of uh, doing a lot on the, on the bank, they put in these uh, rock veins to slow the stream energy. You know, fish can still go through there. Uh, they're bioengineering, they're using willow cuttings, and so in this project, eventually you will have some riparian vegetation which will improve habitat. So um, there's a lot going on here with bioengineering and trying to improve streams. We've basically gotten away from concrete, but you know, there's still a lot to do. Yeah. I'm sorry, one more. How much of a setback do you want from a creek or a stream for a house? Like. I would say that's very dependent on the stream itself and its size. And its, yeah. its motion and right. what's going through it. Okay. So um, the specialty of technical knowledge that understands a lot about stream function is a fluvial geomorphologist. Fluvial geomorphologist. Morphologist. Thank you. So if I had a question, 
I would come contact my favorite fluvial geomorphologist and say, what does this stream want to do? Where does it want to go? Oh. If you have that kind of freedom, you may be required by policy to, post, to by that. certain amounts. Je unfortunately, you know, in, with laws, we'll say 50 feet or 100 feet yeah, you're because right. we have a law and we have lawyers. So it doesn't always get to function. Right. So function. generally people do the best they can, but if they can do anything, then they should stay away from where it's going to move. Okay, thank you. Here's your example of riparian clearing. See, here's a cocoa stream right here in someone's backyard. This person doesn't like those messy plants in their backyard. Um, and so they could maybe go fishing there. Uh, it reduces inputs of leaf litter and shading, which is a temperature problem. And then the banks are vulnerable without that riparian vegetation. That's the number one thing that they're supposed to do. So instead, you should try and maintain riparian vegetation as much as possible. This is a subdivision on this, um, in Palo Alto near uh, Stanford. Uh, this big subdivision over here, here's the stream. They put a little fence here and maintain the riparian buffer. And they left the houses and apartments over here so that this stream would have the ability to have wood inputs in the future and uh, have its riparian vegetation move around a little bit. And that was an innovative subdivision design. I don't believe they were required to do that. But we like that from a fish perspective. And then so that's the that's the apartment complex there. So you're standing on this little buffer and you're looking over here. Um, and they actually have a streamside open space policy of what can be done in there. Um, they need to be managed for the future for growth of large wood. That's an important component in the stream that keeps it from unraveling and degrading. Um, I like fish. I like to go walk along the creek, but um, we heard a lot from folks in, in local areas that this was a poaching risk. There were places that everybody knew where the fish came up, and if they built a bridge there, then everyone would come and catch the fish. So you should think about talking to locals when you're doing design, too, because maybe they know where that place they all go, and then maybe you don't want to put a path or a bridge there because people will mess with the fish. Um, and then uh, incorporating vegetation. So here's the highway, and they've just done a realignment of this creek. Uh, but they did a good job of making sure there's vegetation in their projects. That's important for the fish. Uh, sediment. Here's an example of recreational grading. Somebody was going to do a subdivision, got distracted. There was no control. And you could see. All the rills, all that went right down into a fish bearing stream. We don't like that. There's some land slide slides triggered by construction. We want to avoid that. Instead, we want to make sure we have good construction controls. Um, this is a new bridge alignment. Here's the riparian area. They just didn't go in there. So you can stay out of there, you're better off. They have certain sediment controls here. There's some erosion mapping. There's a lot of innovative techniques and both sides of erosion control. That's important for fish too. Um, that's a construction impact. There's long-term impacts from using land. Uh, road runoff. Uh, here's a pipe, so this has been armored. Here's a detention basin for sediment. Uh, when they did a subdivision process here in Portola Valley, they said, here's some problems, we'll treat them while we're doing this. We'll rock them so that they're not going on for impacts. Roads. I think I put on your list looking at roads. You know, some of you may be in rural areas where we worry about roads. Here is an inboard ditch on a gravel road. Inboard ditches are designed as conveyor belts for water towards the stream. So we're trying to get away from those. This is what we typically think of as a road, as a ditch. And there's a whole bunch of fish projects now where they go and they outslope them. They take away the inboard ditch they outslope and then they drain the water along the road so that it never collects enough energy and transports to a stream. That's some of the biggest amount of funding for fish projects is to upgrade these gravel roads that are out in the rural areas. Is that a hand? What about like uh, oil and things that are collected on the road and the water goes through that? Through the, through the road, through the oil? Well, well, cars deposit things on the road and then oh, the water is sweeping across. Uh -huh. 
Or well, you would have that in this. Oh, sorry. You would have that in this case too, and it would actually have a ditch. So what is done in these cases are it's generally a rolling dip, where you have kind of a, a uh, along the way you put three or four in there, and then it it drains out onto the slope, maybe onto a rock armored outfall, and then it doesn't actually make it to the stream. That's the goal is to break up ditches which are designed to make it to the stream and put in small little structures along the way. So yeah, those things are there, but they hopefully won't make it to the stream if they, you don't give them that express ditch to do it. So, there's still quite a few of these to be done on the north coast. That's where all the money's going to protect fish is, is this. I don't want to spend a lot of time on water quantity because I think your other speakers are going to do it. But you probably know the whole urban watershed thing. If you look at the percentage of impervious cover, the higher the percentage, the more you get as runoff. Less is infiltrated, and the less is evapo transfer fired by the plants. So obviously, stormwater runoff is a huge impact for a lot of our resources, and it's just as much for fish because it's changing the stream channels. There's innovative designs you can use. You can you can design less impervious surface, less driveway. Uh, and some of the research shows you can really reduce um, that by a lot. Stormwater retention, permeable concrete. I'm sure you've been talking about that. Um, here's one in Seattle, a uh, storm edge alternative, or street edge alternative with a two lane wide road that's been redesigned from one with narrow roads and water retention swales. There's a lot of going on as this going on around the west coast right now. Obviously that helps fish. And you're gonna talk about that. So how long do we have? Okay. Yeah. One more question. Uh, I said that before. The storm drains like the gutters that go to the storm drains, is that what you mean by impervious? Because from what I understand, like that's, that's a pathway to the ocean that's that's supposed to be ecologically sound, right? Not, I'm not talking about a person that does irrigation consistently and runs water down the driveway or down the gutter um, and and uh, nitrogen down into the ocean. I think most ocean. of the work going on right now is to spend, send a lot less down the storm. Oh, so storm maybe like further not, distances to yeah, the Yeah, keep it on site. So what that oh, is is a swale. So the water's going in here into right. the swale and infiltrate. Oh, oh. Keep it off the, the, the concrete. The gutter. It's less concrete. So it can go down into the ground instead of running off. Interesting. Mucking with the stream or changing the water quality. Interesting. So you still have those pollutants, like with your roads. You just don't let them go to the stream. Yeah. You have them collecting your swales. I don't know what you're going to do with it then. You might have to. Well. I've so seen an irrigation too. system where, where the drainage just goes across the sidewalk, sidewalk into the easement as opposed to a hole in the gutter going down to the storm drain. It's an actual way of collecting water. You should continue coming to our Friday lectures. Yeah. Right. Oh. Talk about that. I, you know, important. I'm late. I'll be here every Friday. Okay. <laughs> so um, I've given you an outline of the problem, and I just wanted to give you a flavor for how well we're doing at dealing with these problems. And so. I was involved in a series of studies over a five-year period with local groups that had to look at how well they were doing. Um, a lot of this was out of uh, the late 90s listing of coho salmon. And then if you're familiar with you know, endangered species listing, like the northern spotted owl, there's a lot of power behind that, and it can uh, affect uh, local livelihoods. So Trinity County especially, when I saw the map of where 300 feet from every coho stream was back in the late 90s. It was like the whole town. And they said, oh my god, I mean, are we not going to be able to water our lawns? Or I mean, what's going to happen to us? So as a local county, we want to respond, understand the problems, and come up with our own solutions. So they came to Extension, and they said, um, help us figure out what we're doing wrong and what we can do better. So we had a, a process with uh, this group, the Five County Salmon Conservation Program uh, from Del Norte, Humboldt, Mendocino, Trinity, and Siskiyou. Uh, that's a very rural area, about 12 million acres, 16 people per square mile, and not a lot of development going on, fairly uh, depressed economy, uh, and two others. So <coughs> they uh, engaged us to look at how well they were doing in their local policies. Uh, and then we also went out and looked at development sites and we said, okay, 
this went through CEQA, California Environmental Quality Act review. How well did they think about fish and what did they do? How did they change things to accommodate fish? Um, so one thing to say is that local jurisdictions like counties and cities, they're really not the people in charge of fish. You have the Department of Fish and Game, U.S. Um, fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, they look at streams and things like that. So um, they do do things that affect fish. They may do their own projects in streams, and also they permit development, subdivisions, and all those things. So they have a limited role, but an important role. Uh, so I told you about the five county. FishNet is six counties in the Central Coast, and then we work with San Francisco Watershed County uh, Council in the Bay Area. So here's FishNet. That's all the way from Mendocino down to Monterey. And um, urban, rural, wildland, low pressure <coughs> in the south, mostly in Phil and Murray County, that's mostly developed. And then here's the San Francisco Watershed uh, Creek area, San Mateo County, Palo Alto, Menlo Park, Stanford University, this whole area, uh, Santa Clara, all those areas. Um, this is mostly all developed. There was new stuff going on on Stanford campus. But mostly re redevelopment of some, you know, tough neighborhood sites. So we looked. Um, we worked with their planners and their um, public works people. We looked at what they did out in the field. We looked at the policies they had written down. These were mainly what they do: um, levee construction, storm drainage, a lot of emergency grading and maintenance when the floods come, things like that. Uh, street sweeping, herbicide spraying, and it's kind of in that area. There's not a lot of rural road maintenance in San Francisco and Palo Alto, but there's a whole lot of it up on the north coast. So I personally read every general plan and every ordinance and element that might have something to do with a fish. And that was, yeah, I don't think I'll have many of those left in me, but I did spend a lot of time reading all that stuff. Land use, zoning, circulation, transportation, and um, categorize what kind of impacts they were avoiding. And then we reviewed the projects in the field. So what did we find? Basically, there weren't any um, jurisdictions that actually specifically had policies about fish. Mendocino County did have a salmon and steelhead plan, but really wasn't implemented. Um, and they really differed on how well their policies protected it. The best was the CEQA process. So if you're familiar at all with CEQA, if you develop uh, a new subdivision, you'll be required to go through an environmental review. And generally when folks were required to do that, they did a pretty good job with input from state and federal agencies uh, protecting the fish. The hardest part was on already developed lot or something that's considered ministerial and you don't need all that, then there was very little thinking about fish. The others that did really well had, were part of the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, or NPDES, that's required to meet the Clean Water Act. If they had programs like that, then they were working a lot on water quality and quantity, and things like that. So those folks did the best. That's usually larger cities. Um, and there's a process by which different areas have to comply. And the ones who didn't have to comply did much um, <coughs> worse. Water quantity, uh, runoff controls. You definitely saw them in subdivisions. Uh, it's getting to be standard practice to actually put in detention basins and things like that. But if you bought a lot, um, no one in general would ever tell you you had to control your stormwater unless you live you know, in the Tahoe Basin, where I do. Um, there was an exception in, let's see, Menlo Park. If you added 500 square feet to your house, you had to all of a sudden do all this runoff control. Water quality, uh, stormwater ordinances, when you had an NPDES permit, those generally um, were in place in the larger jurisdictions. Uh, riparian vegetation. We want to see some riparian corridors preserved in the development process. And there are very few of those, um, mostly on the coast, because there's coastal requirements. Um, but if you have a single family home, you can pretty much do whatever you want right up to the stream in general. Uh, floodplain development, it's still happening. Most floodplain ordinances would say you have to be uh, a foot over the uh, high water mark. So people, developers would just bring in dirt and fill it up. And then you would be above the high water mark. So that's still happening all over the place. Um, migration barriers, there are no formal policies. There's no new ones being created, but getting rid of the old ones is a big problem. Uh, erosion control, most rural counties didn't have any grading ordinances or uh, NPDES permits, so 
I showed you that picture of the grading and the runoff and turning it down, uh, with very little ability to stop something like that or prevent it. Um, stream bank stabilization. Uh, everyone's trying to do better, but there's just so much out there, it's hard. And private landowners are still a problem. So if you're a guy with a house and streams coming at you, you know, when no one's looking, you throw your old tires or old car bodies, we know we saw that. So it's still, it's still a big problem. Um, in the last five counties since 98, what they've been doing is really focusing on rural road maintenance, inventory roads, trying to improve sediment, uh, improve fish passage, find biologists that can help, give education and training, uh, participating in recovery plans. So they've built up their expertise to do that. Fishnet foreseeing, um, they were looking at in-stream flow in the central coast and trying to have a plan to figure out how to keep that water in the streams for fish. There was one doing a riparian ordinance sediment they were really working on, roads manuals, uh, improving their um, grading policies, uh, migration barriers, uh, participating in plans, you know, getting experts. We worked with a woman who's a fish biologist working for public works. That's her full-time job is to help them figure out how to do better with their grading and their roads and their culture. So overall, after looking at all these areas, um, our conclusion was that you know you have those rural areas where there's still a lot of really good fish, and those are the areas with the least policies and the least controls. Um, some place like a city, like an urban watershed, like San Francisco or the Bay Area, had a ton of policies, lots of procedures, but very little fish. So it kind of seems like our societal response is too late. You know, if you're developing an area with tons of fish, you know, maybe we're not perceiving it as a problem. It's hard politically to put in policies, and um, once it's already gone, it seems like we get really excited and put in all these rules and, you know, it's a little too late. Um, projects require discretionary permits, subdivision CEQA review almost always did you know, pretty well. Um, we thought they could use a lot more expertise in rural areas to prevent future impacts. Um, and so if you want to improve things for fish, you, you need to control development where it's happening. And then there's all this retrofitting to be done in cities. So it's really important and it's really expensive and it's not that easy to do effectively once the infrastructure has gone in. So I mean, my take home lesson from this one is like, before you do it, avoid the impact because retrofitting is difficult and expensive. Um, but local jurisdictions and, and collaborations have an important role in cities and counties. They can do what they can do as part of their, um, as part of their contribution the specific areas that they, they look at with the expertise to do that. Any questions? Any questions for Susie? Thank you very much. As with all the presentations, and, um, they, they will be posted online. I probably won't get to this until like, Monday. I have a question about SmartSite. Have you been getting emails from SmartSite now? Okay, I think I've got that fixed, right? You got any enable access the materials there? Mm -hmm. All right. I haven't seen the videos yet. I, I keep checking to see if they're up, if they're available online. I haven't seen them yet. I know they've been submitted, I think. I think uh, Brad's, Brad said he's Brad's them. doing it. Um, something about Aggie TV? Right. I'm not really sure. Uh, I haven't seen them there yet. If, when I see them there, I'll let you all know through SmartSite that they're available. The power